I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too. 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 I'm American. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Enough, a conversation with the Los Angeles Chargers. I am Jim Hill. In recent weeks, the world of sports has been thrust into the spotlight in the social justice movement, and that even includes the Los Angeles Chargers. And with me now is Charger owner Dean Spanos. And Dean, you have always been one that looks out for the community, looks out for your fans, looks out for your, your, your players. And I'm wondering your thought process as we see what has happened throughout the course of our country uh, that has really devastated us and really torn a lot of people apart. It really has, and uh, you know, needless to say, it's been in a very emotional week for our country, not just sports, but our country. And you can see it everywhere. And you're hearing people speak out, and what I'm hearing, and it's very clear, uh, enough is enough but we need change. And effectively, how are we gonna do that? And that's kind of where my focus is. I know our coaches focus, and I know our players, which you probably heard from yesterday. It's really amazing. We all go out to that beautiful stadium, waiting to see the very first inter-squad scrimmage, and all of a sudden we get word that practice has been canceled. Let's go back, if you can, please, and go through the, your thought process as when you first thought and talked about canceling that practice? Well, I, th I think um, as I look back yesterday, um, it was really kind of more at the last minute that this all happened. I think Anthony has a real good read and pulse of our team, and he sensed that there was a lot of concern about what was going on, practice, everything. It just didn't seem right to him from what he was reading from the players. And I really think, uh, you know, uh, he made the right decision. Uh, it was a difficult decision, but at the same time, uh, it gave everybody a chance that wanted to, to speak, uh, to speak and let everybody know how they felt. I don't know if you heard all of your players, but I hope you heard some of what your, mm -hmm. some of your players were saying that mm -hmm. they want to be in the forefront. They want to be able to contribute right. to the community and to their fellow mankind. Yeah, I mean, you heard it yesterday. I, you know, I listened to a lot of the players mm -hmm. talk and uh, they're very passionate about this, they're very emotional about it, and they wanna give their time. You know, money is one thing and all this other stuff, but time, your time is very valuable. And when a player says I'm willing to do that, that says a lot. And speaking of saying a lot, you stay right where you are because when we come back, we're gonna show you that incredible day at SoFi Stadium that we will not soon forget right after this. Someone we know awfully well, and we love being able to share his perspective with the audience here. Coach Lynn joining us right now. And Coach, uh, I'll just start by, by asking you what the last 24 hours ha have been like and how we kind of arrived at this moment here. Matt, I, I, the last 24 hours have been really, uh, in, in some ways, frustrating uh, with what's going on around the country right now. Uh, it seems like, you know, the more work we put in, sometimes it seems like the worse it get, but. Uh, we, we, we're certainly not going to be defeated by what's going on. We're going to keep fighting for what's right. And uh, this football team is committed to uh, fighting for a championship and social justice. And uh, we just had a, a team meeting in the locker room right now. And we're not going to scrimmage today. You know, we're, we're going to do something different. I thought what we did in the locker room uh, in that last hour was 10 times more powerful of what we could have done on the football field today. So uh, that's where we're at right now. 
Coach, the, the communication, you know, is, is during this time, how have you gone about just getting everybody together to have these conversations? You know, it's just, uh, boy, it really hurts my heart because these young men, they're, they're, they're sad, they're frustrated, they're hurting, and they don't, and some things they understand and don't understand, and, and I feel like I can't do anything about it right now. And, and that's what, I'm their coach, that's what I'm here for, is to help them. And uh, I, I just feel like just having the conversation, just letting everybody get things off their chest and, and, and just speak, uh, I think that was therapeutic in some ways, but at the end of that meeting, I just felt like every man in that locker room was ready to come out and practice. And I just felt like under these circumstances, there's no way we should take the field today. And uh, the players agreed. So that's why we're not, not doing it. Well, Coach, uh, you've, been, you, you've been in a, a position to, to lead men for a long time. Uh, you've been a leader for teams as a player. You've won Super Bowl championships. You've been a position coach. And you know what those relationships are like. But I think in this current time, you can't prepare for this and, and what's kind of no. happened here. So if you could maybe... Walk us through what the last couple months have been like for you in learning and, and how to lead and how much different that is from what you thought you were supposed to do as a football coach. You know, you, you're dealing with, you know, your, your, your opponent, you're dealing with pandemic, and you're dealing with uh, uh, social justice issues. It, it's a lot going on, and we just have to be uh, adaptable, and we have to be able to change every single day and just and kind of embrace it a little bit because it ain't going away, I don't believe, anytime soon. And so... Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's been a hula hoop, but uh, at the same time, these guys have handled it very well. It's just over the last couple of days with what just happened to, uh, in Wisconsin to, to, to Mr. Blake, it's just, it, it was a lot. You know, the, the shooter man seven times in the back and, and, and then a, a white guy walking down the street with a machine gun, basically, you know, gets, way, get waved at and, and it's just, it's a lot to take in, to be honest with you. And, and we had to talk about it. And, and I think, you know, and white players, black players, everyone spoke about it. And I just, it was just beautiful just to see those guys get that off their chest. And, and I just believe that we were just a better football team after that locker room meeting. Uh, it, was, it was very emotional. And, and uh, like I said, it's 10 times more powerful than anything we could have done on the football field today. Coach, one thing that seems to be in short supply in the country right now is hope. Um, what, what, well, we can't we can't give up hope. What what do you tell to the, what do you tell to the guys behind you right there when they when they could be losing some hope? You know, and that's and that was the sense a little bit. But we talked about that money. We can't give up hope. We got to keep fighting for what's right. And, and we knew when we started this protest and this social uprise that it was it wasn't going to happen overnight. It's a long process, and you're going to have some uh, peaks and valleys. And we're in a little bit of a valley right now, but we cannot give up hope. If anything, we got to push harder. And, Coach, last thing, um, and obviously unless you have more, please keep going. But I, I do want to point out, because so many people that, that push back against protests say, what about action? And, and you're a man of action. For people that don't know, we know what you do in the offseason. You're a man that built a school in Africa. You talked about what that meant as someone who has been able to change um, you know, something into actual action. It, what, what have you shared with these players about how you can go about really being that change? You know, it, it starts at the top, and, I, and, I, and our ownership wants action. And, and you know, we, we're, we're getting voter, voter education, registration, getting guys ready to vote. A lot of guys over the years uh, during the season haven't been able to vote, uh, you know, just because it wasn't their focus. Football was their focus. And, and we got to get people in position that, that believe in the same things that we believe in and they have the same worldview that we that we have and so I believe that's something that we can do but we also can continue to bring awareness to this situation uh, it's just so so many people and good people sometimes it's just not you know I can I call it bounded awareness it's just not aware of what's going on in the world today and they're not focused there but we got to get that focus where it should be and I, I think we are moving the needle and once we get, you know, the right people in position and on our side, then I believe we can move that needle a whole lot more and a whole lot quicker. But uh, just we got to just keep fighting a good fight, man. Yeah, we see it behind you. I mean, it is an exceptional group of men. We've been fortunate to be around them. A lot of leaders in that yeah. locker room, a lot of exceptional character. And um, we really appreciate you sharing that with us. You're absolutely right. It's a lot Thanks, more man. impactful, yeah, than anything you could have done on the football field. So thank you for doing that, Coach. Thank you, thank you Coach.
Damien, I'll just open the mic for you. Uh, okay. share, share your thoughts on, on kind of what's happening here today. Um, this is a very, very difficult situation, man. You know, uh, when I woke up this morning, man, I had it on my mind. I saw, you know, a few headlines of guys, you know, taking the stands, using their platform to, you know, bring awareness to the situation, man. And, you know, at first I thought it wouldn't, you know, do much, you know, to miss a practice. I didn't. I didn't think that that would bring awareness to the situation like we would want it to be. I thought that, you know, practicing and, you know, maybe addressing the media after practice would, would do more. But then I also didn't want to give the media an opportunity to stand in the middle of us in the MLB, in the NBA. You know what I mean? Because there are our brothers. And we are a culture, a sports culture that for many years have figured out a way to exist among, amongst each other no matter our skin color, no matter our, our background or things like that, man. So I got to stand with them. I got to stand with them. I got to stand for them. And I can't show any or we cannot show any division in this fight and what we're trying to get, you know, this country to be like. We want we want this country to move forward. We want this country to respect and have, have integrity. And until that happens, we got to stand for something and we're going to use our platform. Tyrod, um, you know, we saw it was an impactful moment from, from Hard Knocks. You mentioned, hey, I'm hot. Let's see if they keep this in there. And, and you mentioned Brianna Taylor's name. I mean, the fact that that's on your mind while you're out there in the middle of practice, kind of walk us through what a challenge it has been is, is clearly these issues are affecting you uh, while you're in the middle of what's supposed to be a, a work day and you can't shake that from your mind. Yeah, um, I think just speaking truth, I think in times in the past, um, guys have kind of shied away from, from being able to speak uh, what they truly believe. Um, it's unfortunate that these things are keep re reoccurring um, in our country. Um, it's real issues that we're dealing with each and every day. And yes, uh, I am a football player, but that doesn't define me and that doesn't define the men behind me or just uh, D square beside me. Um, it's just a portion of our life. Um, we're African American and we play with other races, obviously, but those issues um, impact us and impact us in a big way. I'm pretty sure we have all had family members or even dealt with uh, situations um, with cops in the past. And it, it's sure. unfortunate. And, um, yes, like you said, I'm, I'm on the football field. I'm competing, um, doing what I love to do. But at the same time, you still want to shed light on what's going on in, in this country and in this world. And uh, at the end of the day, it's about, uh, it's about knowing what's right and knowing what's wrong. And now what's wrong. Uh, what happened to Jacob Blake was wrong. And as a unit, um, as teammates, as coaches, as players, uh, we have to do whatever it takes to to start to spread positivity and push the needle in the right way. For sure. And, and Damian, I think it's, you know, I think you kind of addressed it there when you first came on, and that's beyond what just you can do and, and what kind of message you can share because you have the platform right now for all the people that are watching. Um, you know, I think a, a lot of people are looking for direction, and, and sports, you know, provides leaders. A, a lot of folks look up to athletes as as role models um, whether that's fair or not what is there a message is there something you'd like to convey to the people watching right now that they can do to help push this in the right direction um yeah man just affect the people you can touch you know right now i'm on a platform where i can touch a lot of people you know what i mean so like i said man just affect the people that you can touch um the people that's you know kind of desensitized to the situation man we see things on the media every day and you know, at some point, we just make those things a thing of the past or, or things that happen. We make them normal. This isn't normal. And we cannot allow the media to make this normal because we've been seeing riots every day. And we've been seeing brutality on the TV in some form replayed every day and athletes venting on TV every day. We can't make this a thing. We can't continue to live like this. We can't continue to turn the TV on and... Black Lives Matter is plastered all over the place because of police brutality and things that's done to the black community, man. This is not normal. This is not something that we need to make normal. And I think people need to pay attention to that. And people need to stay sensitive about this sub subject, stay emotional about this subject, and in some cases, stay aggressive about this subject for sure. And, and I know one of the debates and one of the conversations that the NBA players just had was how best they can affect that change. Is it while still playing and, and using that platform of, of the number of people that consume, you know, professional sports while also getting your message out, but then maybe feeling like you can't 
contribute as much, Tyrod. I mean, I imagine that is a tough balance for you to figure out what is the right way to go about this. It's definitely a tough balance, um, and we're one of 32 teams, of course, in order to not play, which is that's not on our mind right now. We obviously want to play, uh, but we also want to impact uh, our country and make a change as well, too. Um, but that has to be a conversation that's, that's amongst all the teams. Um, we don't have the answers today. Um, and I can't promise you we have the answers tomorrow. But what I will say is that this locker room will continue to keep uh, doing the steps and uh, taking the right, uh, approach. the right, yeah, the right approach yeah. to going out and, and trying to figure out how can we change. Yeah, and, sure. it start, and it starts within our community. Well, I'm glad you said that because you know, like we said, we've been with the team for a number of years now, and we get to see and, and we know you. You know, when you go back home in the off season, Tyrod, you you affect your community there. The Chargers affect the community here. I can think back two years with Brandon Mebane and and Crenshaw High School and his head coach and making that the, the coach of the year in the NFL and how he affects change in inner city schools. If you could maybe share with, you know, just sort of getting inside your community and not thinking about the bigger picture and, and federal government, but actually enacting real change in your community and what you, Damian, and, and Tyrod have been able to do to see that firsthand. Yes, um, I would say it starts with just uh, communicating and being in your community. In, in your community. Uh, pushing a positive message each and every time you get a chance to speak to them. I've always been a firm believer that uh, with this platform that we have, we have to be uh, intentional in our message. And with our message, it has to be positivity. Uh, there's too much hate in this world. Um, the love is, has been removed from a lot of people uh, throughout this country, and we need to get that back, and it starts there. Well, uh, we are we are proud to be here um, as as a platform for, for you two, for Damian, for Tyrod, for Coach earlier. We know there are more players that – that do want to get involved here in this broadcast and, okay. and share their message. And Steve, you see the powerful messaging. I'm not sad, I don't want your pity, I want change. That is a quote from Latetra Weidman, the sister of Jacob Blake. A number of names have also uh, been put up on the ribbon board as well. Victims of police brutality now joined by Justin Jackson, Ty Long, and other two members of the LA Chargers. And, and Justin, I'll start with you, and I'm just gonna start with the same way uh, I did with Damian, and that is just your thoughts and what you wanna share after that hour-long meeting that, that Coach Lynn said was, was very powerful. Yeah, I'm just really glad that we had that uh, space together to talk about what we feel like is the appropriate uh, message to send and the appropriate steps to take uh, forward. And what we came up with was that, that we didn't feel like this was the right space to be out here in the, right, in the mindset that we're all in, uh, really affected by what's happened to be out there practicing right now. Instead, we wanted to use this space and this platform that we have to actually advocate for some real social change. We're not talking about symbolic change. We're talking about real change in the lives of black and brown and poor communities all over this country. We saw some real re legislation, real not empty promises from both sides of the aisle, Republican, Democrat, or whatever. We want real change for our people. And we're talking about state uh, and local governments and the federal government. We want some, some people that are going to be in there that are actually representing us, that are actually representing our needs, of com needs of our community. Um, and we felt like this is the right platform to really advocate for them. Ty, how do you, how do you go from sympathy and empathy to action? Yeah, I think that was a thing we were talking about. And, um, you know, me and my wife were talking about this last night. It's like this, this world needs more leaders. We need, we need less followers and more leaders. It's, it's time to step up. Like, when, when you know something's wrong, it's, let's, let's point it out and be better. And, um, you know, the, the thing that's tough is listening to all my teammates, my brothers talking, and um, it, it's, it's tough hearing some of the things that maybe I didn't have to deal with as a young kid. And, um, you know, growing up in Atlanta, playing football, you know, with those guys, I was so blessed to be just – with with everybody I, I grew up with every skin color and i'm so blessed to have that and um you know i think that's one thing that this world needs to see is like we're all the same i, I it's just frustrating to see that people are still treated differently because maybe their skin or, or whatever it is it, at the end of the day we all have conscious we all know what's good and bad and um it, it's time for everyone to step up i mean at the end of the day we need more leaders and less followers and um you know if you have something on your heart say it you know, have the tough conversation and, uh, and go for it. Because at the end of the day, if, if we're not making this place better, what are we doing? Justin, uh, for, for people that don't know, uh, you're, you're someone who, who went to Northwestern, and certainly Evanston is, is not the area where, where I grew up, and that's the other side of the city in the south side. You, you know what that city is going through. You lived there for a number of years. Give us a, an idea of, of what that experience was like and, and how what has happened to the city of Chicago over the last 10 years has helped kind of 
mold you into the person that you've become and, and demand the change that, that we're seeing right now in 2020? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I grew, I grew up in a suburb of Chicago, but my grandparents lived in the city, so I spent a lot of time there, and I saw the differences between those two places. I saw the differences between what, um, you know, a budget for a, a suburb is where you have a small police precinct and you have a lot of resources allocated for other things such as community programs and schools and after school programs. This is how you engage um, kids in the community and, and help them and nurture them to grow up. And you don't see the same thing in the cities. You see over, um, you know, over balloon police budgets, which year after year, you're taking that money away from resources that can be used to help those communities, right? You're just punishing poverty year after year, and that's exponentially um, negatively affects these poor black and brown and poor white communities as well. So that's what we're, we were out here talking about is how can we get the attention of the people we need to get the attention of to really advocate for this real change, right? We don't just want people talking about, oh, you know, we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we'll give money to this and we'll give money to that. We want actual real change in government that's going to implement policies that are going to help these people who are working two and three jobs, working really hard but not getting back what they're putting into um, our society. And that's that's a policy choice. And so that's, I think, why a lot of us are very frustrated because like our, you know, our, our special teams coach was saying, he's 62 years old. He was seeing these same things 40, 50 years ago. Like things have not changed at, at the rate that we want them to. And we believe that if we're actually fighting for that social change, we need to uh, step up and do something about it. And that's why we decided uh, not to have practice and use this platform to really advocate for those things. Question for both you guys, Justin, first here. W what's the message to, to the young people out there who have uh, are, are fighting to get starting to get more engaged now as we go forward? Yeah, I think honestly, social media and everything, I think has really helped the younger generation because we can talk to other people who feel like us and it makes us feel less alone. So we understand that there's a problem in government, there's a problem in local, state, and the federal government when it comes to representing the wants and needs of the people, right? When we want something, we should have government in place that gives us what we want. Well, right now, during a pandemic, we want health care. We want a UBI. These are things that we want that our government is not giving to us, right? We want the police to stop killing unarmed black men. We want, the, we want racial profiling to stop. We want community policing to be better. We want... Like these are all things that we want, but we're and we're crying out for them. We're protesting, and we're not seeing those changes, and that's why we're very upset, and that's why you see all these protests happening right now. So I think that's why a lot of people are very frustrated, and we all understand it, we all feel it, and that's why we're trying to do something about it because a lot of us and our parents come from these communities, and just because we're out of those communities now doesn't mean we can't give back and try and help and use our voice and our platform to help those same communities that we came from. So I think that's why a lot of guys feel really, uh, really strongly about uh, this topic. All right, well, go ahead, Ty, please. Yeah, I mean, I feel the same way, you know. I mean, when we're sitting in that meeting, it's, uh, it's, it's just, it's tough. You know, and I, I think the one thing is that um, the, what I feel is from our politicians from the top down, um, it's time to put policies aside and, and, and look at it and say, like, what's right and wrong? Like, can we just do what's best for the, the, our, the people? We all love this country. Is it perfect? No. Is, is there a perfect country out there? No. But at the end of the day, we have this country. We have this platform. We're trying to use it. And, and there's so many, there's so much good in this country, but it's being outweighed by the bad right now. And that bad is, it's a big deal. And it just needs to be better. And, and that's why we're all just trying to come out here and do our part and, and do whatever we can to help. And, um, you know, it's that's why we all talked about getting in the community and doing what we can to help. And, um, you know, whatever we got to do, I think it's, it's big and it's important to us to help change. Well, we appreciate it, Justin. Certainly appreciate your perfect description of it. it's not just federal, it's, uh, it's state. There's going to be legislature spots on that ballot in November as well, so make sure you pay attention to all those elections. Let your voice be heard. Thank you so much, Ty. Appreciate Thank you, you so much, Justin. We'll have more player conversation when we return. All it takes is one word to understand the message here at SoFi Stadium. Today it says enough, and we'll hear more from the players when we return at SoFi Stadium. Live inside SoFi Stadium here in Los Angeles. You see the quote there from Latetra Weidman. I'm not sad. I don't want your pity. I want change. Enough as well on the Oculus scoreboard. The ribbon boards portraying names of victims of police brutality. We're here with the Chargers. It was a scheduled practice and scrimmage 
Uh, instead, we have had some very thoughtful, salient conversations with players over the course of an hour. It was started by head coach Anthony Lynn, and joining us right now, Michael Batchley and Isaac Rochelle, another couple Chargers uh, that certainly, Isaac, I'll start with you. Uh, we've, we've heard quite a bit, and, and what an impactful meeting it must have been with coach, with all of your coaches, as a matter of fact, uh, when you came to the decision that instead of practicing and scrimmaging today, um, you were going to instead share a message with, with the people that are watching right now. Yeah, you know, I think I always say this. It's a testament to our organization uh, and the guys that we have on our team. Like you talk about somebody like Anthony Lynn coming into the locker room, opening it up to the players, um, and him being willing to have an open conversation I think is huge, especially right now. And then you got guys like Justin Jackson that are standing up saying, how could we possibly miss this opportunity to talk about these things and talk about people getting killed by police in the streets daily? Um, how could we pass up that opportunity? So I'm thankful for the people that I have around me and my peers. Michael, I'd be curious what, what your message has been to, to your white teammates and for all the, the white people that are watching you right now, what, what they're asking, what can I do? What, what's your message to them? Well, you know, first and foremost, you kind of look at it from a perspective of, you know, I, I'm playing football and being around football my entire life. Uh, the teammates that you create and uh, what is created throughout your entire life is you kind of don't see what goes on in the world. But as you get older, you start seeing what truly happens. And uh, creating the friendships and the bonds that you create with your black teammates and all your teammates, um, you just kind of sit there and you, th you think, why? You know, why? You know, you, you want there to be change. And uh, not enough has been done. There needs to be so much more to be done. And, you know, one of the things that I've loved about, you know, becoming great friends with Isaac is seeing what he's done in the community to help that out. And, you know, some things that he's been doing with local human, I'm wearing the shirt right now. Um, you know, when, when the protest started and, and everything that's, that's been going down in the, these recent months and, you know, our lifetime, Coach Stu even brought it up. It's, it's a lifetime that needs to be changed. Um, so being around it, seeing it firsthand in the news every day it, it, you just it's just sick and tired and it, you don't know what you can truly do but you know that change needs to happen and when you got guys at the forefront with our leadership with coach lynn jj justin jackson isaac rochelle derwin james tyrod taylor the list goes on we got guys in that room that we can do this you know and having a voice like this what we got this platform today having you guys here at sofi stadium us taking a stand with what we're doing um, we're in the right direction. We, we can't wait to do more because there's so much more to be done. All right. Isaac, I'm just going to let you, you know, I, I know you probably don't want to feel like you're, you're promoting something, but it's worth promoting. So Michael said it, uh, what you're doing in the community, the, the shirts that you're wearing right now, can you share with, with the people watching exactly what it is that you're doing? Yeah, so it's, it's Local Human. You can go to localhuman.co and learn more about it. Um, and we've been doing a lot in the community. I think the point, the, the bigger point that needs to be made is, a lot of people, you know, find excuses for not doing stuff. One excuse that we've heard a lot is, I need to have more information. I need to learn more about, you know, what's going on in the black community. And I need to learn more about their narrative. I think when you see somebody get shot in the back seven times by a police officer, that should call immediate action. I think you've learned it. I think a lot of my teammates have learned that, listen, when you see these things, you got to act. There, there doesn't need to be this huge learning curve. I think uh, what, what I've learned is, the same thing you know I don't need this this intense learning process I'm seeing people get killed I'm seeing all types of issues systemically within the black, black community and the access to different things like food and resources um, and, and I acted on it so that's kind of where local human is right now but again localhuman.co we're, we're doing a lot to make changes in the community I would love for you to, to share uh, every single one of the players that have come on the, the headset. And, and we've been fortunate, you know, working with the team to get to know them as well, have talked about Coach Stewart. And just as, as, as great a resource as anyone could ever have on a team for coaching and for, for your personal life, C can you share anything with us, if you're comfortable doing that, kind of specifically what he shared with you, uh, just the, the pearls of wisdom that, that he shared in that hour-long meeting? Yeah, Co Coach Stu emphasized that he's been through it all. Uh, you know, coaching as long as he has in this league, he, he's seen firsthand, you know, what systemic racism is. Um, he's seen it firsthand in real life growing up. I mean, he grew up in Arkansas, as I can tell you, his dad's out there, you know, how uh, brutal it still really is. Um, he has just seen it 
firsthand uh, in the most, you know, brutal way you can think of. And he's gone through it, and he's he's continued to push through. And he's just one of those guys that, you know, in the locker room really had such a powerful speech and spoke to so many guys. I think, I think just to build on that, what you're seeing is you're seeing an extreme buildup of frustration. Yeah. I think Coach Lynn, like he said, or not Coach Lynn, excuse me, Coach Stu, being from Arkansas, experiencing all the racism, uh, you know, climbing the ladder as a coach, ex experiencing racism in that, and then now he's 62 and he's seeing it still today, again, with somebody getting shot seven times in the back by a police officer. It's a buildup of frustration, and I think we saw that in the locker room. I think one thing to point out about Coach Stu, and he said this, he has told each and every one of us that he loves us yeah. many, many times. So you talk about a guy that I respect, uh, probably top out of all coaches that I've had is Coach Stu. So his story definitely meant a lot to me. Last thing for you guys, and again, we really appreciate you, you sharing your, your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, you know, very raw here um, with everyone that is watching. But um, I, I think it, it bears questioning, How, what do you do tomorrow? You know, when you, when you put your head on the pillow, you wake up tomorrow, you think about all the emotions that are coming out of you today that came out in that locker room, and, and tomorrow you're probably going to be asked to wake up and get back to doing what we thought was going to be scheduled today. Right. I'll start with that. I mean, I think for me, like we talked about, local human. I'm committed through Local Human and through the Do Good Foundation to really try to create opportunities for the black youth um, in the L.A. area, in the Orange County area. I'm going to get started with that right now. Um, and I think, I think more than anything, it's just continue to have the conversations. We have them all the time, these conversations that are going to bring growth um, and bring people that are more open-minded. Um, so that's, that's kind of my game plan. Yeah. And... And it's, today is a day where we truly are getting our voice heard. Um, and Isaac and I, as a platform that we have on the Mike and Ike show on our podcast, uh, this is a day where we get a bunch of guests. We get a bunch of teammates to come on and voice their opinion because getting the word out is so important. Um, just truly taking this day, and we, we know tomorrow is going to be tomorrow, but getting this day and protesting the way we are and emphasizing that is one thing that we want to really do. Just maximizing. That's it. Just maximizing. Well, we, we thank you for your work in the community. Uh, we thank you for your thoughts. And again, the raw emotions here today. Uh, Isaac, Michael, thank you. Appreciate right. it. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. Yeah. And you see the end of that quote from Jacob Blake's sister uh, saying, I'm not sad. I don't want your pity. I want change. And that is what the LA Chargers have been messaging here today for the last hour. We're now joined by their general manager, Tom Telesco, inside SoFi Stadium. Tom, uh, you, you've been in this game a long time. You've been in a number of different organizations, and, and I would assume today is, is unlike anything that, that you've ever uh, had to deal with. But, but what a powerful message that, that your group, and I'm sure you're very proud, has been able to share with the nation today. I love this team. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is a wonderful stadium. We've waited three years to get in here. Uh, but uh, today's not the right day. It, it really isn't. When you look at the emotions from our players, our coaches, and our support staff, I mean, it, it ranges from, from anger to just utter frustration. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's powerful and painful at the same time. So, um, you know, we've, we follow Anthony's lead. We talk about be the change all the time. Um, and, and to be the change individually, if each individual can affect change collectively, you can do amazing things. Um, but we're not getting those amazing things fast enough right now. And, and to, to see the way our team has come together through this, um, it's, it's powerful to see. Tom, for those that don't know, this isn't the first time that these discussions have taken place with the team. You know, it, this has been a conversation with the Chargers going through the offseason via the, the Zoom meetings. Yes, you know, and we have great leadership. And it, it obviously it comes from our head coach, Anthony Lynn, but it comes from the players. And you just talk to a good amount of them as far as their perspective. Um, and, and we talk about this a lot, too, is, you know, just being in the NFL doesn't define who we are as a person. What defines us is, is how you treat people. Um, and the change you can make in your communities. And then for our players, the change that they can make nationally because they have the big platforms. And even our head coach, the change he can make globally. And we all know what Anthony Lynn has done. So, um, you know, I think that's important for everyone to remember. You know, I know this is, this is what we do for a living. It's very important to us. We have, we're passionate about it. But uh, it doesn't define just being an, an NFL person. It, what defines us is how we treat people and, and how we can affect change. You know, Tom, I, I know if they were here, they, they'd love to, to share their thoughts, uh, be it John or, or Dean Spanos. But as the general manager, you know, I go back to last night and the discussions that were had in the NBA about ownership and making sure that ownership heard what the players' concerns were. If you could maybe share with us from an organizational standpoint kind of where the players' concerns are and how you as an organization feel like you can 
can help them with those concerns and let them know, yeah, we are all pushing in the same direction. Well, I think the biggest thing from ownership is that they care. I mean, they really, really care, and that's where it starts. Um, and, you know, I know football is a business, but, man, this, this is a big family here. We spend a lot of time with each other, um, and we listen, and we talk, and, and you try and work things out. But uh, I think the biggest thing from, you know, from the top is, is that they care. And they care about the players, they care about the staff, they care about the coaches, and, and we're all in this together. One of the things we get a chance to ask all the guys that have spoken today, Thomas, about what their hope is. You know, what, what is your hope here as we go forward? Well, I hope by something like this, and obviously with, with the NBA not playing playoff games and NFL teams not practicing, I mean, that just brings incredible attention to what, what's going on. So if by chance you don't know what's going on, hopefully you know now. Um, and and it, it can't just stop here. You know, we talk about, you know, when the season, when the football season starts, you know, it can't stop. We have to keep going with this. And, uh, you know, we can all um, multitask. You know, we know what our job is, is to play football, win football games, but there's other things we can do, and affecting change is, is going to be a big part of that. Yeah, and, Tom, you know, we, we asked Isaac and, and Michael in the very last segment there, kind of, you know, you still have to put your head on a pillow tonight and wake up tomorrow. And that may mean a day of practice. It may mean a, a scrimmage for you as someone that, again, is in that position of leadership, someone they look to as, as a guide. Um, what, what do you do when you put your head on a pillow tonight and you wake up tomorrow and try to figure out where and what this leads to? Well, I can tell you what. I'm thankful I'm here. I'm thankful I'm with this football team. And as far as the, the football part of it, we'll get that figured out. That's, that, that's, that's the least of our concerns right now. We've got plenty of work, plenty of days, plenty of practices, plenty of situations to put players in. Um, we'll be able to handle that just fine. Yeah, and just one last thing I do want to share is it's not just a general manager or a head coach, but you said it. It's staffers. There's so many individuals in an organization, and one name we heard regularly from every player was Coach Stewart. And yes. as, if you could also maybe just share some, some insight on how special an individual it is that you have in this family and what he means to this group. Well, you hit on the head. He, he's a special man, and he has a wealth of experience um, going through this. And... Um, you know, he's, he's a great leader. You can see that as a coach, you can see that as a person. And, uh, you know, people like that in this organization, it just means so much. Um, but, but, but Coach Stu is, you know, he's more than a football coach here. We have a lot of coaches like that. Phil, Phil McGogan spoke to the, uh, to the team as well. Um, but uh, you can't have enough people like that, that, that to have the experience and the perspective and just a powerful voice. And, and uh, Coach Stu has that. I love him to death. Well, uh, we appreciate it, Tom. We know uh, it's been a very emotional day. A lot of raw emotions from all the players, from the coach. Anything else that you want to share? Um, otherwise, we, we know you've got a lot to get to. There's a lot of players, certainly, and this conversation is going to continue for you guys. Well, I really appreciate the NFL Network letting our players uh, have a platform and a voice, and, and I know a good amount of players came up and spoke. So, um, you know, thanks to everybody, you know, back in the studio that allowed them to do that and have a voice. That, that's part of not practicing today is, you know, Let's get the attention out there. Let's, let's use the platform. And, and uh, so thanks for allowing us to do that. Absolutely. Uh, certainly, I, I'm sure they'll be OK with me speaking for them. Uh, it was it was absolutely uh, our pleasure. Uh, and, and it was, I think, everybody's watching. Um, everybody was able to watch this. It was a benefit for them. So thanks for doing it. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Tom. How can sports help in this crazy times that we're going through now? Well, I think the platform that we have to offer is tremendous. I mean, people all over the world listen to people in sports. Mm -hmm. And here's the platform, here's the opportunity. And you know, our players, and you heard them yesterday, very emotional, they care. When you, you see that, you hear that, uh, it makes you really motivated. We got to do something. The only thing that's you know discouraging from this perspective is you can't do it in a week. You can't do it in the short term. This is something that's going to take a lot of time. But I do believe if everybody comes together and does something, I really think there's the opportunity. You're going to see a tremendous change in this country. And when you talk about do something, that leads me to think about that phrase of action speaks louder yeah. than words and this is exactly what the charges are doing you are putting in some action now yeah I mean yes and I you know I've said this before and to me whatever those actions are they're gonna happen in the short term here but I want to be able to look back I know Anthony wants to be able to look back in a year from now and say you know we put these programs or whatever they are in place 
and here's the net result after a year. We may have to change them or tweak them or whatever, but we're making progress, we're doing the right thing continue, it'll get bigger and better as time goes by. I remember when you first hired him, you talked about not only is he and was he going to be a great coach, but he was going to be a great citizen to not only help his team, but people in the community. And here's a perfect example of what you were talking about. Absolutely. He's a very innovative type of an individual. Uh, he cares. Uh, but he's, he's proactive. He wants to do something. He doesn't want to talk about it, which you've heard him say many times. So, uh, you know, we've shared a lot of time together, uh, and I've picked his brain a little bit. And, you know, our goal going forward right now, what is it that we can do? And I, we're going to be meeting with the players to get some feedback from them, more specifically in terms of the types of programs and things they would like to see us, the Chargers, get involved in more in the community to help make a change. When you look at your fans, if you could talk to them right now, what would you like to say to them? Because you have a lot of fans that are out there and they're looking for answers. And in a lot of ways, in times of controversy, people look to sports and sports personalities and sports owners to help them get through some rough waters. Yeah, this is definitely a difficult time. As you said, patience is important, but you know, I know there's a lot of impatience out there and, and you can't blame anybody for that when you see what's going on today. Watch what's happening. I would tell the fans, watch what's happening and, and you will start to see slowly some changes being made. We want to thank Dean Spanos for having us here with him today and to discuss a very, very sensitive issue. And when I think about talking to Dean, I think about one of my favorite sayings that I've ever heard and it comes from Dr. Martin Luther King when Dr. King once said, giving back to your fellow mankind is one of the most noble things that anyone can do. And what could be more noble than what the Chargers and all of our athletes are doing to try to give back to the community, to try to help those that need help, and in particular, help our young people to show the young people that there is light at the end of the tunnel. That's gonna do it for this program. I'm Jim Hill saying thank you so much, and we always have to keep the faith.